Life Before Supercars with Brock Feeney. I feel like you're a familiar face to a lot of people in the sport now, but I'd love for our fans to know a bit more about the background and how you got here. You're not the first racer in your family. No, certainly not. My dad, Paul, was a professional motorcycle racer in Australia, so raced in Australian superbikes, did a fair bit of stuff overseas as well over the years. Yeah, back dating into the, the late 70s and 80s. For the 1983 Australian Grand Prix for 500 cc motorcycles. And uh, Feeney's fifth and Dalson's a fair way back. I kept like running up 105, 110 degrees and just boiling his head off. Pretty successful in that. Um, once he finished his racing career, he went into, he had a Kawasaki dealership and built all the way up to importing and distributing Husqvarna motorcycles in Australia. So when I was born, I was born into a motorbike family. Him and mum met at a racetrack. Mum used to run a lot of promo girls around the country. So yeah, ever since I can remember, I've, I've been brought up in a motorsport family. Yeah, what were those early days at the racetrack like growing up watching your dad race? Did you always think that two wheels was going to be your world? Yeah, for sure. Two wheels was me since I was, you know, able to walk. I was the pest son that was always riding bikes around dad's factory. And uh, I mean, I started riding bikes, like com not competitively, but at all the tracks at three years old. So. Yeah, as soon as I could start walking, I was I was riding something the whole time. Dad ran a professional team for Husqvarna with the Enduro and the motocross. And once I grew up, I started doing flat track, but I was basically following Dad around every weekend, hanging out with the best guys in Australia. We were getting world champions flown in and stuff like that. So from a young age, I've been surrounded in this motorsport life. And it's nearly been like every weekend since I can remember that I've been at a racetrack and just hanging around, I suppose. And when I look back at it on now, it's the people that I was hanging around with then, they're like amazing people. And I think that's sort of what's helped me get up through these ranks. Yeah, who were some of the stars from back in the day that you were all hanging out with? I know that you and the Dewins are pretty close. Who else was around at that time? Yeah, <laughs> there's a long, there's quite a long list. So um, yeah, dad got some great mates that have gone on to do great things. Grew up with Jack and Mick Dillon as well. We were always traveling around the country racing go-karts together, but that relationship goes way before myself and Jack were born. But Jason Crump, um, me and Seth, we're best mates. We went to school together, same thing. Dad's known him for a long time. Troy Bayless, Casey Stoner, dad looked after for a bit. Um, there's a massive list. And then it even just goes to the team, whether it was Matt Phillips, it was world champions that dad was, you know, come through dad's team and stuff like that. So. It's been crazy and to think about that, like I was a little kid growing up hanging around like the greatest in motorsport in the world and you don't really think about it at the time, you just think of a, a, a mate. So it's, it's pretty cool to look back on now. So when did two wheels become four, mate? Uh, I was about eight or nine, I think. So it was 2011, I went over to Thailand um, for a family holiday. Yeah, I was about eight years old at the time and we went to the hire cart track and I think we spent every other day of the holiday at the hire cart track. We went four or five times over like the week we were there. So, I mean, up until that point, I was flat out on racing dirt bikes and I wanted to follow dad's footsteps and, and go road racing. And my whole goal was to try and be a MotoGP rider. And to be honest, it was pretty much in an instant that that changed. I, it's like, it's crazy how quick it happened. Like I went and did the stuff in Thailand, drove the hire carts, we came back and one of our mates through Dirt Track and that used to work for Dad was friends with a go-kart dealer and there was a come and try day on at Ipswich. So we went out, went to the come and try day, loved it, carved it up and we went and bought two go-karts and they still sat in the shed for a few months but after that we went out to mix little track at his, at his backyard and, and had some fun there and went and did my first race and the bikes never saw the track again. And what came next was an amazing karting career from club level to representing your country on the international stage. Can you run us through some of the amazing karting success? Yeah, some of my best years for sure, the karting. So started when I was nine in 2012 and basically wrapped up at the end of 2017. But like I had so much fun over that period of time and you're like so fortunate to do some of the races and the biggest karting events in the world. So build up through Australia, always sort of tried to do one overseas event a year and it just gave me so much experience. Like even in my first year of go-karting, we went and raced in Las Vegas. Like that just started at, we're having dinner with one of our mechanics. He was like, oh, do you want to go to Vegas? And we're like, 
Mum's like, go shopping. Dad's like, how cool is this? We'll go race overseas. So always from a young age, we went and did stuff that was a bit wild at the time, but it gave me so much experience. And as I built up, won the Australian Kart Championship and stuff like that, once we went overseas, we were podiuming and fighting for race wins as well. So it, it all happened very quickly for me. Can you run us through some of the countries you got to go visit and race in when you were a kid and, and what was that like for you? Yeah, so I raced in Vegas, I think five times over that six years, so I only missed out the one year, but raced in Italy three times, raced in Singapore twice, Portugal once, like there were so many races that we tried to fit into the calendar and it was always at the end of the Australian Championship year, we'd try and get over and do a race or two and it was pretty cool. At the end of 2017, we sort of um, lived over there for about two months and yeah, did some of the world, the biggest races in the world over there and, and ran very successfully. And that's when I hung up the karting boots and picked up the car ones. So who were the people that you trusted for that next step out of karting? Who was in the circle that you had to use for making those next decisions, the classic pathway to supercars? Yeah, at the time, towards the end of the 2017 go-kart championship, I was actually looking at Formula 4. Um, raced overseas and go-karts went very well. and. We, I was like this little kid that sold, I want to go to Formula One. We, we sort of came back, me and Dad had a bit of a chat and really thought that it wouldn't be possible to reach where we wanted to. So we sat down with Paul Morris and had a chat to him about, you know, what could we do? We'd known Paul forever, but he'd always followed me in karting. But as soon as I got into cars, he's been a massive influence for me the whole time. He said, do 86s. He said, it's the perfect pathway to try and get to supercars. So ever since that day, I mean, I was a 15 year old kid. I was pretty bummed I wasn't gonna go and race overseas, but we set our goals on supercars and we've worked our ass off for the last few years to try and get there. The Toyota 86 s were one of your first steps up through the ranks. What was that year like for you? Uh, Cause it was a record breaking time. Yeah, it was awesome. 86 s was crazy. And when I look back on it, I was a 15 year old kid that had done zero car racing. And to think that we came in, um, and did so well in that first year even. It was myself, dad, Johnny, my go-kart mechanic, and we had uh, Trent from, who had a bit of race experience come in and help out with my mechanic, Johnny, with a bit of setup stuff. And man, we hit the ground running. Like we won two races, we got a couple of podiums. Um, and yeah, I think the record holds that I'm the youngest ever race winner. And I was at 15 years old. So it's, it's crazy to think about. Remember this name, Brock. Feeney, he's 15 years of age and in a 36 car field at one of the biggest tracks in the country, he'll pick up a race win. Congratulations to Brock. It was a great year. Absolutely loved 86s. The field strength is so strong in it and we got to go to all the tracks. So I was in front of, you know, people like RD and that who are watching and learning these tracks, which has certainly helped me up to date. So tell us about the first time you got to sit in and start up a supercar. Where were you? What was that moment like when you were able to hit the throttle? Um, I was 15 and Paul Morris invited me out to QR to do some laps in the FG that I ended up running in the Super 3 Championship. So he was running Shay Davies in Super 2 at the time and yeah, just invited me out. He said, we're going to run the Super 3. Uh, it was about August in 2018. He said, come out, have a go. Like, unbelievable experience. I'll never forget it. It's, it was crazy. Like, just driving it for the first time, I probably did 25 laps or something for the day, but it, it was mind blowing. Like had an awesome time. Uh, it was a crazy experience. Like you see on the fences at QR, it's like under 16, not allowed into the pits. And there I am driving a supercar at 15. That year in Super 3 was really strong, wasn't it? We had an amazing field, lots of talent, guys like Jaden Ojeda out there to beat. How important was it for you to win that championship? Yeah, 2019 was a crazy year for me, like stepping up. I was only 16 to race the year in, in the supercar championship. It was awesome. The field was packed that year and like there were some really competitive guys in there and a lot more experience than me at that time. So, I mean, we rocked up to Phillip Island, got pole position and won the first race. I was like, oh my God, like what is happening here? Like, this is crazy. You know, I went into the championship trying to win it and I thought we could do that and had a great team, you know, with Paul Morris running with him for that year, um, working at Norwell, just gaining so much experience, helped me a lot. And, it was, a t it was a tough year. Me and Jaden went down to the last race and <laughs> that continued on to Super 2, that rivalry, but it was a great year. Had so much fun and, and learnt so much. Just running with Paul and did a bit of stuff with Erebus that year as well. So got a lot of knowledge out of that. You know, the five races that we did, I think it sort of put me on that stage a little bit where people started noticing me a little bit more and started talking to me and we had a few more opportunities. I 
in that one year I drove the Erebus supercar and I drove a DJR supercar, so it was, yeah, pretty crazy year for me. Your year with Tickford in Super 2 was really important for you, but can you tell us how the deal came together to be here and become a Triple Eight driver? How did that change of direction happen? Yeah, over the 18 month period from the end of 2019 to, you know, the, or it was the end of 2021, so in that 12 month period, we looked like we were going in so many different ways. Like before I signed with Tickford, I was pretty locked in having a relationship with Erebus. Um, Paul Morris got a call from Rod Nash saying, hey, there's a seat in Super 2, we want Brock to drive it. That door changed, we went to Tickford. So then we ran with Tickford for the Super 2 series and, and got the co-drive at Bathurst, which was awesome. You know, Pete Adderton and Boost gave me a massive chance there and so did Tickford in letting a 17-year-old kid race at the 1000. But then I sat on this table right here behind me and with my dad, Simo and RD and uh, when we got back from Bathurst and sort of put a Super 2 deal together, I, I found out just before Bathurst and the whole plan was Jamie's going to retire at the end of 2021, um, we want to put you in Super 2, if you do a good job you'll get Jamie Wincup seat and at that time I'd done a couple of races in Super 2 with Tickford, um, had a shocking Adelaide, got uh, Qualified on the second row at Sydney, blew my races, like didn't really do too much, but you know, Paul Morris and RD get along very well and, and Roland believed in what Paul was telling him and it's it's crazy to think that, you know, two years later I'm in supercars. That championship winning year in Super 2, let's just chat about that for a moment because you had a really strong teammate in Ange Missouri's, but there was also the carrot of Car 88 being there for you. So how much pressure were you under to succeed? Yeah, it was a crazy year and looking from the outside there was heaps of pressure on me but I didn't really feel that because all I wanted to do was win the championship and my end goal was, wasn't was about trying to get the drive this year, it was about trying to win a Super 2 championship. And I always said for that from the start, if I win the Super 2 series I should deserve a seat in main game and, and that's what we did but I mean, especially once Jamie's retirement was announced, the pieces of the puzzle started getting put together with my face on it. So. I mean, after Townsville, I was getting hammered all the time in the interviews. I had a great couple of rounds up there and everyone's like, surely you're going to get Jamie's seat. But um, yeah, it, it was a crazy year planned out. And to be honest, it couldn't have gone better for me. I was with a great team. Marty, my engineer, who's now come up with me, we had a great relationship there. And yeah, we, we had a very successful year. Well, it's been a great pathway to enjoy watching from your karting days to where you are now. Congratulations on the success, Brock. Thanks for telling your story. I hope the fans got to learn a bit more about you and all the best of what's to come. Thanks very much, I'm looking forward to it.